Yes, if I record this so they don't have to drop what they're doing and watch it later. And so, uh, boy, I tell you, this guy, Chris, he comes to all of these Zoom things. Good for you, Chris. Um, and we have some new members queued up and some, some others. So uh, I do want to remind folks because, I, you know, this, is, this year has been, uh, I guess I call it another transition year. The first year of COVID was a disaster. Second year, we did the, uh, the Zooms and recorded the PowerPoints. Uh, and so they're all available on our website. And, and uh, so this year was really just kind of an informal get together for an hour, talk about things. But, you know, when it comes to, for instance, the topic of today, maintaining nursery culture equipment, I didn't bring any props. I didn't bring any uh, pictures. I went to go queue up some pictures. And the first thing I saw was our video on that, uh, on this subject. So, you know, it's definitely available to you to see and, and to look at all these. Uh, I'm just gonna go through, uh, you know, what's going on, but also folks are always welcome to come by the Marine Center down at uh, Cedar Beach. We're there Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, uh, eight to noon. I'm actually there at like six thirty in the morning, but you don't have to. You don't have to jump out of bed and come and see me at six thirty in the morning. Uh, I just happen to live a lot closer these days than I have for the last ten years, so I I get up and I get going like I always did, but I don't have the hour and a half commute. So uh, there, you can see everything live, and I think that's. Uh, I think that's kind of critical at some point for folks to come down and, and really get get a feel of, of what we're doing out there because it's uh, it's very unique and and every SPAT member has the ability to be involved in all aspects. We don't have any hands off uh, things that we do. So we we just spawned scallops this week. We're gonna be spawning scallops for uh, another couple of weeks. And this is all community. Uh, so Charles uh, Peck has been kind of the, the lead on uh, running the spat hatchery right at the moment. Otto's taken a little bit of a break. He, used, he ran it for 20 years. And uh, so 20 years, boy, Otto's been around a long time. Chris has been around now. How many years are you, Chris, now? Five seems like a lot more than that because I see you all the time. So you know you get you get double. You get ten because of double double uh, uh, attendance. So I get I get a lot of that. People say it seems like you've been around much longer than. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. No no no. That that wasn't meant to to be a derogatory comment. That it's just that. Uh, you, you're definitely an active member, and I appreciate that. And, and you know, again, the way this SPAT program works, there's no minimum or maximum or anything. It's, it's, it's what you want out of the deal. And so uh, we have a lot of people that have been coming down because it's, it's a nice place to, to go for an hour. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I had a, uh, we're doing a thing on, on uh, Ram's Head, at, on Shelter Island every Friday. And I had a bunch of SPAT members last week, including Betsy uh, Narden, who is there. And she she said, well, it's it's great to go down there because you have all this great equipment. Now you can pull a pressure washer up, you can pull one cage and get it done and it's easy. And and that's how it should be. You know, we, 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 we've definitely learned a lot of things in the 22 years that we've been doing SPAT. And uh, so everything is queued up and I'll just go through a little bit of, of where we're at and, you know, a mention of these uh, nursery equipment. Next, next month's lecture, I will bring some props, even though it was already recorded on how uh, people configure uh, their shellfish gardens for, for new folks. But again, you know, keep in mind, if you're local, and by the way, Goose Bay or Goose Creek is wicked local. So, you know, that that's right around the block. And anybody that's close by, 
we have a new uh, a new SPAT member, Randy, who's been coming from Aquabog, and that's you know a little bit longer of a hike, but you know it's just a great place to be on a nice day. And uh, Chris, on the other hand, comes when it's pouring rain in his industrial strength gear that he got for himself. So he looks like a real bayman uh, these days. But and so you you can do however it fits your your scene uh that's how it's always been at spat and it's working fine so right now uh being the end of may and happy holidays coming up for everybody we will be there tomorrow eight to noon uh we will be at shelter island doing a sh oyster shucking lesson if anyone wants to come by and i the new my new band shuck and jive plays every friday so from six to nine at at, uh, at the ram's head she set up uh, andreas the new the new owner of the ram's head and she actually set up a spat uh club there at the inn so every friday i go and give a talk from 4 30 to 5 30 and it's open to everybody uh, not just shelter islanders except it we all know that the rock is way off the beaten track uh, for us on the mainland, but uh, it's a it's a beautiful place. Uh, there's wonderful food. It's a great setting. And we do this talk every Friday. We'll be doing that all season long. Um, the so Monday's a holiday. We won't be at the Marine Center on Monday, but I will say that uh, seed has started to go out to folks, okay, which is wicked early. I mean, we're a good solid month early. Uh, we did a spawn on Valentine's Day that did very well. We did a spawn, I think three weeks later. Uh, there was a holiday around there. I, I seem to be doing things right around all these holidays so I could have them on the mentally in my brain on a calendar. I can't remember what the second one was, but in any case, we have a, a very nice batch of oysters. And uh, I, I was thinking about what I would say to folks that are on this talk or watching it later when it comes to getting seed. Normally, we uh, Darcy will send out an email saying, seed is ready. Hey, Tom, uh, seed is ready. Uh, and it's about the 4th of July, or I, it's usually the 5th of July. And so, you know, now that I think of it, that makes us really quite early for, for getting seed out. Uh, there are a couple things that you can't say to me when I give you seed. If you, if, for instance, if you came in for seed tomorrow, don't say to me, they're so small. Okay, I know they're small. They're about the size that everyone gets them the 4th of July, uh, but they're small. I mean, th they, they are growing and we're gonna talk about the machines that they're growing in that make them bigger, faster, uh, but it's, it's not yet June and you can get your seed. So don't say they're so small. You can wait and you can get them bigger. Yes, Chris? Are you muted? Are you raising your hand? Yes. Are you waving at yes. me? Uh, the seed, is it small, so small that it has to go into a mesh bag? Okay, now here's the case? second thing. Let me finish, Chris, because the second thing I was going to say is, don't say to me, are these going to go through the cage? I would not give them to you if they're going to fall through the cage, because, I, I, and it was a great question, by the way, Chris. Uh, we have these fine mesh bags and I give people the seed in these fine mesh bags and it's a real mistake to keep them in that mesh bag. They get stunted, they get, it, it's bad. And sometimes people will put them in there and forget about them. I've actually found abandoned uh, spat gear with the bag with the oysters still in them which means that person just completely surrendered to some other cause. Uh, the seed, what I do with the seed is I, I, I 
size it on a size that's bigger than the small mesh cage that you're going to put it in so that they won't fall through. So you're going to get them. I wouldn't give them to you if they weren't big enough to put in a what we call a number one bag. OK, uh, keep in mind that if you wait, there, there's a fine dance here. And here's the fine dance. Getting them early. The first people that get their seed are getting the biggest seed early. And that seed last year when I gave it to folks over at Tiana, they were eating their own oysters at Thanksgiving from that seed. That's how fast they can grow. If you waited till August, you're gonna get much, you might get the same size seed and it's the, the screenings of the screenings of the screenings and you'll look at your, your buddy next to you and they have oysters that are six times the size of what you're getting in August. So it's good to get them early. Uh, uh, where and when do we get seed? Oh, somebody just said we're in a way. You can, the seed is available at, at the South Hole Marine Center if you're growing at your own dock or locally. And I bring it out to Tiana on Tuesdays uh, once we're set up. So there's, there's a whole Tiana group. It's 100 people this year. It's quite large group. So seed is available at the, at the Marine Center on, at Cedar Beach in South Hole. Uh, or, and everyone has either Darcy's or my email. If you have any issues, feel free to reach out to get all this squared away. Uh, so there was, don't ask me uh, if it's going to fall through the mesh. Uh, don't tell me it's too small. And there was another thing. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, don't say, are you sure that's a thousand oysters? Okay. And, and we're going to be very generous this year with people because we have, we, we have actually quite a bit of oysters this year. Uh, I can show everybody how we do the volumes. Uh, we're doing a lot of this, uh, you, you know, getting, getting ready. Only about three or four people have gotten seed so far. And that was on, on uh, what is today? On yesterday. People got seed yesterday. So it's just starting to flow. I, I called out some uh, some seed from the machine and I had like 30,000 that takes care of the first 30 people tomorrow if 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 they wanted it and I got there's plenty more coming down the pipe so uh that that's going on and Darcy just sent out the link for my email if you don't have it I I look at my email incessantly and I usually answer people unless they are giving me some cryptic or weird or something kind of thing that I don't want to respond and hit the delete button. Uh, and then just email me again, if you're persistent. No, I won't delete you. So, so that's going on. Now, here's how we get at our seed. So what happens was, and again, feel free to go back on all of the recorded lectures from, from 2021. They're all there on the on the algae culture, on the spawning and conditioning, on the larval rearing, on the post set. Those are the first four lectures we do every year. And then the fifth one is this systems. Uh, and it's all there available for you if, if you have any questions. And again, come down and see us live and we'll torture, torture you live uh, with all of it. And we'll even put you to work doing stuff. Uh, but what happens is we grew our algae in our algae room. We fed it to uh, adult oysters to get them ready for spawning. We spawned them on Valentine's Day was our first spawn. Uh, we raised the larvae, which took about two weeks. We then <clears throat> took the larvae and set them on what we call micro culch, little tiny shell chips to make your nice single oysters. And uh, we did that in, in the hatchery, still feeding them the algae that were growing, still maintaining warm water, filtered water, everything in a hatchery. Uh, and they went on the first piece of equipment, which is called a downweller. Now a downweller, is a set of tanks that flows water downward through the seed, the spat, which is sitting 
on a, I call it a silo. It's like a, a, a little, uh, it's like a little sieve with a screen on the bottom. And the screens are very specific mesh so that the oyster seed obviously doesn't go through the mesh. But water is flowing down from the top, through the animals, out the bottom, and out the tank. Unless it's a what we call a static tank, which just circulating round and round. Static tank means you fill the tank up with heated water. There's no new incoming water. It just goes round and round and round and round. Uh, I will. I'm going to mute my phone. There we go. That was my son, hopefully, telling me he got a job. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll let you know later if he got a job or not. Uh, he just graduated Columbia Grad School, so he better get a job because somebody's got to pay for that. Anyway, uh, it's going down. And you do that because the animals are very, very small. When an oyster undergoes metamorphosis and sets, that's what spat is. It's going from a larval stage to a juvenile. We call that post set or spat or seed. You can call it anything you wanna call it. It's about 250 microns, which is a quarter of a millimeter. And so you get an idea of what a millimeter is. A millimeter, one millimeter is your window screen mesh. So it's pretty fine. And so we're flowing the water down. And the, the, the reason why we're holding them in these tanks and flowing water on them is we're feeding them, we're feeding them algae. And in order for them to feed, they need flow. They need some flow and it circulates and it gets everything moving nicely and wastes can be removed with the flow, but you, you want a flow rate. And the downweller has the slowest flow of all the systems. It's not flowing at this tremendous rate. It's probably flowing per, per sieve or silo. It's flowing less than, it's flowing like your shower, not your bathtub. If you turn on the spigot of a bathtub, it's actually coming out pretty fast. If you turn on a shower, it's coming on small. It's like a downweller is about the flow of a shower head down in, in, into there. And it, and so the, the critters can feed and it's going round and round. It's keeping the food uh, circulating and it's going single pass down and down and down. And theoretically, the reason why you use a downweller is theoretically, the seed can't escape that sieve because water's flowing down. Now, the problem with some downwellers, uh, if you use a very fine sieve, very fine screen, it can clog and then the water will stop flowing well through it and the water level can rise and rise and rise and actually go over the top of the sieve. Then theoretically you could lose something off the top. Uh, that can happen, especially if you're growing scallops because they can sw actually swim out if it goes over the top. By the way, I meander a lot. People that know me know that. Uh, newcomers don't are gonna get a taste of this. Here's, here's a meander. So I'm at the Ramset Inn and the maitre d' Pascal says, do you play any Leonard Skinner? No, we don't play Leonard Skinner. So I'm working up a tune that's gonna be called Freeboard. I don't know if you get that joke. If you know Leonard Skinner, there's Freebird. It's a popular tune. Freeboard is that water level rising. The water level rising to the top of the silo or your boat or whatnot, that's the freeboard. If it goes over the top, uh, if it goes over the top of your boat, your boat sinks. If it goes over the top of the silo, the seed can get out. So the flow can't be so tremendous that it clogs the screen and the water level rises. So that's a downweller. We run that downweller until the, the seed is about, let's say it's about 
one mill uh, one millimeter. Let's just say one millimeter. We've run uh, the next system in in finer uh, size than one millimeter, but let's just say we run this system until the seed is all right, 750 microns. Does that make you feel better? Okay, 750 microns, three quarters of a millimeter. Okay, now we take them out of the downweller and we put them in another contraption called an upweller. Now an upweller, it does exactly the opposite. Water fills a tank, comes up from the bottom of the screen and leaves the tank through the sidewall in a single pass, 24 hours a day, ambient flowing raw seawater, just flowing and flowing. Uh, again, it's on our, uh, to, I know that's confusing to say it without any visuals, I agree with you, but I'm enticing you to watch our video of this lecture that we gave last year that has all the pictures, all the descriptions, all the flow. I'm not going to bore you with it. I'm just going to mention to you that this upweller is flowing water from the, but you've probably heard the term upweller, by the way, from, they used to always talk about Peruvian upwelling and all the guano islands and they were the birds eating the anchovies and and putting guano on the rocks and everyone going out and harvesting it for this great great fertilizer and it was because of upwelling offshore and that's just a term for naturally occurring water lifting up and and circulating and that's very healthy it's very healthy to get uh, circulation of the water. So you get uh, no stratification of temperature, no stratification of food. Everything is blending well. It's like tilling in a way, this upwelling. So upwelling tends to be, uh, areas of upwelling tend to be very plentiful with life because of this flow that's creating. It's, it's really quite nice. So with our system, and we have right now in our shellfish hatchery, we have one upweller bank running. It's run on a two horsepower pool pump. There's three tanks. There are right now eight, 11 silos running. And in the 11 silos, there's a million three hundred thousand oyster seed in the in the in the land based upweller that are running. They're our smallest seed. They're under well, tomorrow, this is what I do. You, if anyone wants to have fun with, with Dr. Tetro, you can call me Dr. Tetro. I never got my, somebody, oh, it was the press. It was, it was uh, W-L-I-W called me up and said, Dr. Tetro, we'd like to have you. Oh, doctor, I love that. You know, I don't need my, I have a PhD. It's, it's in my garden shed. It's a post hole digger. Get it? P PhD? Yeah, post hole digger. Yeah, I got a PhD. Yeah, I dug a hole with it just the other day. My son, he dug a different kind of hole when he went to Columbia, which we're going to fill. He's going to have me fill that, I'm no doubt. So there goes that meandering again. What's going on? Okay. So uh, there's about a million almost a million and a half little oysters in the land-based upweller. And what I do when I come in at 6.30 in the morning when nobody's there yet, I start my process of what I call panning for gold. And if you want to have some early morning fun, I personally, I've been doing this literally for 30 years and it never bores me. It always fascinates me because you take this thing of oysters out and it'll say on the side, We've already done some counts and some measurements, and it'll say, uh, it'll say May 9th, 1.8 liters, 256 oysters per milliliter, 300 something thousand oysters. It'll say that on a little piece of tape. And I'll take that out and I'll run them through this series of sieves to, to size them. And if they retain on a two millimeter sieve, they're going to go into our next machine that we're going to talk about. So every week, and what's fascinating about that to me is that every week you get to witness how fast these oysters are growing. 
because I just did this last week and now I'm doing it again. And I'll pull out a whole bunch of oysters that have gone through the sieve last week that now retain in it. And that's, you're witnessing growth. And it's, and I call it panning for gold because you put a cup of these oysters that are all kinds of different sizes. You put them in the screen, you bobble it about a bit, as they say, and some stay there and the rest fall through and you're capturing them. And we size them out. We take new volumes. We count them. We calculate them or blah, blah, blah. I personally think it's one of the more fun tasks at, at SPAT when it comes to the aquaculture part, because you're really, you're, you're panning, you are literally panning for gold. And I say that because you want to get your seed you can't get your seed unless it's been panned out for you by size. That's how we do it. If I were to just say to you, here, here's some, throw it at you. Do I know how many there are? Do I know what size they are? Do I do all these things? I have to know these things. So there's a way of, of calculating how you know these things. And that's what we do. And I always enlist spat people to help. Uh, because it's fun. I, I think it's, it, it, and it's not, uh, it's not overly burdensome. It doesn't, it, it's not like if I said, uh, go out in the back pile and pressure wash these 64,000 dirty nets. Now that you might say, yeah, I don't I think I'm going to just uh, see you later. And off you go. But if you're, if you're messing with, and at the end of the day, when you're in the supermarket and you run into your friend, you say, you know, I put my hands on a quarter of a million oysters today. How cool is that? Because so there's not that many people that do that, that can literally say, I put my hands on a quarter of a million oysters today. Uh, I don't know. I maybe I'm, I'm, I know, no, not maybe. I am a tunnel visioned geek. I know that, but I still find it fascinating. Okay. And I'm willing to share my tunnel vision geekness fascination with you so uh you can judge for yourself whether that's cool or not uh, so that's what i'm going to do first thing tomorrow because we now that we're into the end of may we're in what's called i said before when we spawn when we're raising algae when we're culturing algae when we're feeding brood stock for spawning, when we're spawning, when we're larval rearing, and when we're setting these things, we're in the hatchery, 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 hatchery. All of that has, has a cultured, cultured microalgae component to it. They don't get real nature water yet. They're in a hatchery, it's very controlled. As soon as this temperature changes and we're getting into spring and all these beautiful things are exploding all around us and the water temperature is rising and you can see the color of the water is getting kind of greenish and hopefully not coffee brownish or, or uh, kind of mahogany reddish. Uh, those are all algaes that are growing in the water. And once that happens, we get to stop feeding our oysters, nature is now feeding them. All we're doing is providing the water and the flow to them. And it's all natural water. And so they're on auto feed. They really are. Now we just are maintaining the system so that they don't clog, so that they're flowing well, so that we have everything stocked well, so everything is feeding appropriately. And literally now watching them grow. And so this part of the process, I would say, let's see, we're into, in another two weeks, we're gonna be done with the land-based upweller and this panning for gold up top with the, with the upwellers, land-based upwellers up in the building with these silos and the three tanks. All of that seed will have gotten big enough to go into our next piece of equipment which we call the floating upweller or the flupsy. Now, don't call it a flopsy, call it a flupsy. It's cute enough as a flupsy, it doesn't need to be a flopsy. And if you call it a flopsy, everyone knows that you really don't 
know yet what any of this stuff is so it's a it's a little i can always tell when somebody's like oh yeah nah, 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 we're running a flopsy at our place and it's like okay yeah 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 it's probably all gonna die on you learn to learn the learn the nomenclature so a flopsy is floating upweller system flop c Fl flow up system flopsy and uh, Cornell has actually been a pioneer of, of these floating upwellers for, I, we, I've been there 27 years and we've had floating upwellers for 27 years. And we wrote a paper on it 25 years ago. So we've been, we've been doing that for a long, long time. And they're remarkable machines because they're like the land-based upweller, but the flow rate is about an order of magnitude greater. And there's a, I'll throw this, I've always thrown this equation out every time I give this lecture, the Seston flux equation. Oh, Chris is shaking his head yes. So we're gonna put him on the spot and see if he remembers what the Seston flux equation is. Yes, flux, Seston flux equation states that flow plus or times algae concentration in the water equals growth. Oh gosh! Now there, I'm the, I'm I'm now the proud professor of a student that retained something after only five years. No, he probably got it the first year, uh, and that's exactly right. It's a very broad statement, but basically what it's saying is that flow and algae will will allow growth uh, to happen. And Glenna, who's over at, at in uh, in Goose Bay, or Goose Creek, as we call it, is living in an area where I think of the natural Seston flux equation incarnate is right there at the Goose Creek Bridge. It flows a six knot current in, a six knot current out. That's your flow. Algae is what happens in nature, and we and and for some reason it's very very good algae concentration, and you get growth out of control. It's just it's it it you can really see that equation come into play when you have dynamic algae component in your creek and it's flowing a good a good current. So we in the nursery. That's what we're capitalizing on, the flow part of the equation. We can't control the algae part of the equation. We can only control the flow part. So the floating upweller is the maximum flow that we can achieve in, in our current uh, array of machinery. And it does just fine. I remember one year, and obviously the, uh, the, 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 the algae concentration was very good. I would take one liter, uh, one liter flask of oyster seed, put it in a barrel in the floating upweller, and ten days later it would be a ten liter bucket. So that's a thousand percent growth in ten days, uh, which is phenomenal, and it's starting kind of to happen now. And that's why I'm very kind of neurotic about getting these things out of the land base at two millimeter, putting them in our floating upwellers, and then they pump up and pump up. And we're gonna spend months maintaining the floating upwellers because we have a lot of seed, uh, we're, we're gonna be maintaining it. And, and by the way, I ran one over winter for the last two years. So any overflow seed that we have, we're gonna overwinter in the machine so that people have, I didn't get, I didn't have a lot of overflow seed last year. So we have very little overwinter seed. The good news is, so that's the bad, I have some for new members, I'll spike them with a, a hundred or a couple hundred bigger oysters so that you have some. If people, if they had a problem and you need some bigger oysters, I don't have a lot. I don't know how many I have, but, but the good news is that this year's crop will outpace last year's seed. Totally, I know that for a fact. So if you're like, oh, well, I want some, I want that big overwinter seed, get the little new stuff in your, in your array and it will outpace any overwinter seed I give you, I guarantee it, because the overwinter seed were the runts from last year. 
they, they, they're not, you know, they're kind of cool. They're big. And I like giving them to new members so that they have, you know, these things, but I can almost guarantee you that this year's seed will out, outpace uh, the overwinter seed. So we're going to do that. The, the floating up weller, again, if you want to learn about it, if you want to be involved in it, uh, it, it's a remarkable machine. It's what I would call, it is and have often called the epitome of uh, appropriate technology. I call that appropriate technology because it's not high tech. It's not low tech. We built all the machines. We operate all the machines. You don't need a degree. You don't need anything. You don't even need to be that strong to do it. And it works. It grows your, it grows this seed. Now, here's the, what I want. Here's what I want to happen in the next couple of weeks. However, and I know Chris is going to come right up to, right up to snuff on this one. The question I have is this: If you came in tomorrow and you got a thousand seed out of the machine and you put it in your cages. So that's Friday the 27th. That would have been my mother's 92nd birthday tomorrow. I'll remember that. She, she just passed away, but she, I'll remember her 92nd birthday tomorrow. And if you set your seed out on the 27th of May, and I keep running them in the machine, whose oysters grow faster? And I can almost guarantee you again that yours will because you've got a thousand in your cage and I've got 40,000 in the barrel. I'm getting tremendous control and tremendous flow, but you're getting space and the whole creek. So it would be interesting to actually uh, measure that, document that. So it's your birthday too, 20 to tomorrow? Oh, you got to come by. We'll celebrate. Congratulations. I bet you're not 92. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if you wanted to share that, by the way, Chris. <laughs> it was your birthday. I kind of blew that one, didn't I? Okay. So anyway, uh, that's, that's the kind of things that SPAT folks should be doing. It's experimenting in all kinds of different silly ways. Uh, this would be an experiment. If we if we were to track our biggest seed in the in the floating upweller, which I do, I track them incessantly. Uh, and your seed, which one's growing faster? The reason why I say that is this: Let's say you come tomorrow and you say, "Well, you know, you said they were going to retain in this cage, but I think I'll wait." a couple of weeks until they're bigger and then I'll take them. That's totally understandable. And a lot of people say that, but I wonder if you're actually doing yourself any favor by waiting, because a lot of times you're thinking maybe, well, if I wait a week, they're going to be in this machine and they're going to grow really fast. Well, they are in a way, but are they going to grow as fast as if you put them in your own cage. And I've set a couple people up to, to be looking at this. Carrie is there, he's got his seed. Uh, we got a new guy, Randy, he's got his seed, a couple people. And I'm gonna be tracking it because I'm interested. I don't know the answer, right, really. Uh, today, I don't know the answer. I don't know if, if I said to you, now, you know what? Just hold off for a couple of weeks because by the time you get your seed, it'll be twice this size. Well, that might be true, but if you took them and you put them in your cage, they might be three times the size. You don't know. Uh, so that's what we're gonna look at in the next two weeks. So I, I leave it up to anybody to do. Yes, uh, Kim, birthday why boy. Wouldn't the Why wouldn't the flow be higher in the upweller system as opposed to in the creek, for example? Oh, the flow it well, no, here, here's the dance. Here's the dance. And this is what I'm saying. The flow is definitely, definitely much higher than the creek without, without a doubt, because that's what it's doing. 
But remember what I said, you've got a thousand, I've got 30,000 in this barrel. So the stocking density and the food availability per animal, even with this flow, might not equate quite the same way. If it were that I put a thousand oyster, well, this is an interesting concept. And again, uh, it's one that's kind of hard to explain to folks. I tried to explain that the way that a, an upweller works best is picture, uh, let me see. So picture you have a sieve. It's a, any, a, a ring of plastic with a screen on the bottom and water is flowing through it. The best way that an upweller works is if the screen is uniformly coated with the seed. And the reason why is if there's a thicker amount of seed, let's say there's a half an inch of seed over here on the side and over here in the corner, there's none at all. And it, it, it's, you can see the screen. Now when water is flowing through there, the path of least resistance is definitely through the part where there's nothing there. And so you get what's called channeling. So picture a little volcano or geyser of water going here that's not feeding anything. And here's a half an inch of animals that are getting some feed through the bottom. You're not getting a good uniform feeding. That seston flux equation is falling apart on you because you're not getting an even distribution of that flow and algae concentration. So one of the tricks of having a floating upweller is to have that these barrels really nice and thinly coated, but thick enough so that there's, uh, that, that there's resistance throughout the thing. So that theoretically they're all getting equal-ish amount of, of, of food. That's Darcy saying happy birthday to everybody. Yes, to everybody. Happy birthday, Oz. So uh, if I were to put, uh, I know my brain is firing, but I remembered if I were to put a thousand oysters in the barrel and you put a thousand oysters in your cage, I still wouldn't be necessarily getting the same results as you because I probably would because I'm really giving them a lot of flow, but I'm not using the machine to its optimal ability to grow oysters. But I will tell you actually, those thousand seed in a barrel alone, and if they didn't rumble and become like gemstones uh, as they're tumbling around, uh, they would grow very fast. They would grow very fast. Uh, we could set that up. We, uh, I'm going to set you guys up with experiments because we actually have a lot of these floating upwellers because we were pioneers of it. And because when the governor's grant was there, we built 70 of these units. I mean, I've, a SPAT is going to run this year uh, six or seven of them. That's about 70 something barrels, which is an awful lot. Even if, even if there were... Uh, 30,000 in every barrel, that's, that's 2 million seed, which we have, by the way, this year we have that much seed. Uh, we've got a lot of seed. So we're gonna be running, hey Drew, we're gonna be running a, uh, a, a lot of these barrels and uh, there's a lot of maintenance, but it's fun if you keep up with it and you got a team going. So I, I encourage anybody that wants to come by to, to give that a shot. Um, you know, I, I keep, we have a lot of new members. We have a lot of enthusiasm. There's still a lot of talk about oysters and a lot of these things going on. And for the life of me, I'm living the dream because our project is a, just a, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving my attaboy. I'm giving everybody their atta people, atta people out of girls, out of, out of boys. Our program is so unique. It, it's so vibrant and it's doing what no other community group in, is doing in aquaculture because 
I mean, we do every single part of it and everybody is welcome to learn every part of it. If you want to learn how to spawn scallops and try to grow scallops and get scallops into your garden, that's what we're doing just as an aside. We've got our oysters are, 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 are happening now. There's still a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things to do, but there's plenty of room for experimentation. Uh, I'll tell you another thing that we did this year, which is going to be fun, and we're going to do this every year. Uh, I did I did two spawns of oysters, and I received a third batch of larvae from from one of our hatcheries. The third batch of larvae, I figured, well, we did two spawns. We set two two sets of oysters. We've got a whole bunch of millions of oysters. Do we really need any more oysters. So I took the last, but yes, and I agree with you. There, you can never have enough oysters. So uh, what we did with the third batch is we actually ran a relatively large batch of spat on shell. And so what we did was we took oyster shell. We actually did a little bit of experimentation, but we took shell, whole shell, put them in our tanks, dumped a million or so larvae in the tanks and the oyster set all over the shell. We have an entire floating upweller with spat on shell in it. And those oysters, by the way, and this, this is, is exactly, I, I'm, I'm glad I thought of this because it just proved to me something that I had just said that I wasn't sure of. And now it reminds me that I'm definitely sure of it. The oyster set, which was the last batch of oysters that we did on that shell are huge. They're huge. They're, they're, they're growing so fast. You can almost watch them grow. And the reason why is because there's not that, there's not that many oysters in every barrel. Instead of there being uh, 60,000, there's probably 15,000. And because of that, they're getting tremendous flow, lots of space, no competition, and they're growing really fast. Because we just yesterday pulled up a barrel and looked at the seed. And the oysters, they're the same age as my intern's oysters that he did that was the same last batch. And his oysters are about a millimeter. And the ones on spat on shell are five millimeters. They're five times the size. They're in the floating upweller because they were on shell. They were just stuck on shell. They couldn't go anywhere. And so what I want to do with that shell is I want to dole it out to some folks to plant around their little creek beds and make these little bushes of, but we did this at the Marine Center. The first time I ever planted spat on shell, you, you take a little bucket of shell and it's got oysters on it. And you walk along at low tide and just push them into the, into the banks where the rib muscles are. And you try not to push it in so that the oyster goes under. You find a little spot of the shell where there's nothing there and kind of put it in the, I came back a couple months later and it, and there was a, it was like a topiary. There was a little bush of oysters growing off of this shell. And it was just the greatest looking thing. That's reef building. I mean, you're reef building. That's what they, that's what all these places that want to build reefs, that's what they're attempting to do. Well, we should be playing around with that too. So we have a whole bunch of shell that we can play with. And uh, these are the kind of things that I want to be doing. I don't want to say to anybody, uh, you know, this is what we do. We do the same thing every year. This is what we do. Just get used to it. It's kind of boring, but we don't want to be bored. We want to do different stuff all the time. We want to keep people, you know, we have a group of folks that come every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, year round, eight to noon. Every, they never miss. So why are they coming? Well, because we mix it up. Sometimes they're learning how to fix an outboard motor. Sometimes they're, you know, painting something or 
whatever. Sometimes they're working on their oysters. Sometimes we're maintaining all of our pressure washers and all of our this, whatever it is. If you're interested in learning something new, I found that in the SPAT program, there's almost nothing that we can't do that has something to do with what we're doing. Wow, what a sentence. I bet I would have gotten an F on my essay if I wrote that. I don't even know if I can repeat it. I'd have to wind the tape back. It's, there isn't almost anything that we can't do that we want to do that you've done in the do. See, yeah, see, can't be, can't even be said again. The point being, if you want to try something new, whatever it is, including testing out your new waiters, I mean, it doesn't matter. It 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 adds spice to life. It really does. So, uh, you know. I don't try to torture anybody. Scallops are pretty torturous. You know, people have been trying to add scallops to their garden for ages and it's tricky. That doesn't mean that, oh no, we try that. We don't want to do that. No, we want to learn how to do stuff. We want to improve on things. Oysters, they're, they're pretty forgiving, but you know, the fact that SPAT members love to fool around with the tumbler or rolling your oysters to make them cuppier or whatever it is. I found that the pressure washers, lately I've been pressure washing these old oysters that I had. They come out looking beautiful and they just, you know, they, and it definitely must toughen up the shell and all these things. So whatever it is that, that uh, oh, and by the way, so here's one that Chris is going to love and anybody that's growing at the Marine Center is going to love. On Wednesday, I ran a new line out to all our pull lines. So we're going to be fixing. I finally am getting around. I have a telephone guy who's trying to get me 10 used telephone poles to drive into the creek. But, you know, until then, we just ran a new line. And we're going we're gonna to get all the lines nice and straight and tight and get everybody happy and organized because right now, it's Willie Nelson meets the, the creature from the Black Lagoon out there. It's like, oh, my not son, my, this guy's bumping into my, yeah, I know, it's a chaos. I mean, my life is chaos. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change it into organizational skills all next week. We're gonna get everybody's line straight, nice, organized space, no more fighting, no more, no more biting. And so that's part of, you know, you want to be involved in that, you can do that too, whatever you want to do. If you don't, you can, you know, I actually had two, two members yesterday, they ran their new lines out. I was out there, they were all tangled up. And I said, now, nah, you know what, it's time to get this ball rolling. So I ran the line out, they hooked them up, and they went home with the biggest smiles on there. I bet they were in the supermarket out aisles just saying, oh, you know, I just came back from doing my oyster garden. And I've, I've seen that. I, I, that's no joke. One day I walked into the IGA in Southold. There were two SPAT members with their SPAT hats on talking in the meat aisle about oysters. And I thought, what have I created? What have I done? These poor people. It's like, you know, get a life. And that is the new life. I mean, how many, how many of your neighbors say that they, you know, have an oyster garden growing in the backyard? That's pretty cool. So, uh, Anyway, those are the kind of things we're doing. I really encourage you to, uh, you know, the website is getting better. The amount of, um, uh, of information on the website is really quite, quite uh, phenomenal. Darcy's done a, a wonderful job of having everything available. You can queue up all these uh, PowerPoints if you want. Uh, I'll start doing live again next next year. We're going to go live. Uh, COVID is still God. What a what a tenacious thing it is. Uh, you know, the Marine Center is just going to have summer camp for the first year, and I bet you they're still going to run into COVID problems with the kids. It's just not going away very quickly. So uh, we've been fine. Everybody's staying safe. It's a good place to be outside. Lots of activity. Um, we're improving. And, and by the way, this is our program. 
I'm totally amenable to any suggestions that makes your life easier. I always act on it. They wanted a bilge pump for the boat. We got a bilge pump for the boat. We got all the cleaning supplies for the boat. We're going to run the new lines. We're going to, all the pressure washers are new this year. They're all, we got everything working fine. We're, I, I am picking up another cement mix or oyster washing machine. Uh, I had to order it, but it's coming. So all of these things. And if you say, well, you know, it'd be really nice to have bot. We get it. We that that's why we you know we we we're 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 nonprofit. We spend the money on the program. So if you need stuff to improve your lot, I just did a you know eight hundred dollar cable tie order. <laughs> yeah, we the you even the U line lady came by. She gave me a little sticky pad on a on a fake little pallet. Here, here's your. And I said to her, well, the SPAT program runs on coffee and cable ties. You know, it's like, without that, we're shot. So uh, we got plenty of gear. Everything's there. Don't, for new members with lots of questions, the answer is, it, it's like Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. We walk everybody through every part of it. You don't need to know anything. You don't need to get anything, just come on by and we'll give you everything you need. It says, it, if it, I say the same thing every year. If it were hard to do, I'd have three members. And we have like, I think we're gonna have over 300 members this year. So it's, it, it's totally doable, no worries. And uh, so I'm there Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. I'm at Tiana every Tuesday. I am on swing shift on Thursdays. I look at my emails all the time. I get a lot more emails on Sundays than I ever have in the past from spat people, which is fine. I answer everybody, you know, I'm not, I'm never lonely. I'm never upset. So uh, feel free to reach out, feel free to come by. Uh, and, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have an awesome season. And have a great uh, holiday weekend. If you ever feel like spending the $64,000 to get to uh, Ramsed Inn and watch Shuck and Jive and have dinner and eat some oysters, we're shucking every Friday. We're giving shucking lessons from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, there will be oyster flights going out. Uh, serving all kinds of different, we're working on the arrangement for all of that. And it's going to be a great season. And I look forward to seeing everybody live and in person. Good. Thanks, good, good, good. And I'm going to stop recording. So I remember.